We're going to have a good morning today, okay, Maxine? I don't want any trouble from you on the front today. <laughs> she called me a slaphead last week. <laughs> and then said, Evan, I, this morning, she said, Evan, I just want to apologise about it. So I said, what, do you want to apologise for calling you a slaphead? I said, oh, you don't need to apologise. But she said, no, I just wanted to remind you. <laughs> <laughs> but where is the respect? <laughs> Father, we pray in Jesus' name, have your way with us today. As we look at the story of Gideon, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us. Go deep in us, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So there will be um, quite a bit of times I look around and I read scripture. Every word of the Bible is worth listening to. As we've discovered, not every word of mine is. But every word of God is worth listening to. And so this story of Gideon, we're going to find it in a book called Judges. And what's happened is Israel, in the, to be fair, in the book of Judges, it's like a cycle. Like They're doing well, the Israelites. Then they turn their back on God. And then they need restoring after they fall under the, the hands of someone else, like a persecutor, if you like. Then they come back to God, then they, they fall, then they're restored, and then they fall, and then they're restored. And it goes on and on. Then we have this lady called uh, Deborah, and we get Deborah's song at about chapter 5, something like that. And then we walk into chapter 6 of the book of Judges, and we find out that there's a group called the Midianites, who were really oppressing the Israelites. And we may pick the story up now. In Judges 6, verse 6, it says, so I'll just read this first, then we'll pick the story up. Judges 6, verse 6, it says, So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. So the Midianites, just to cut a long story short, Every time the crops are being built, made, grown, every time the, the sheep, the cattle, that they come out, the Midianites and others come down and take them. Like literally come and steal the Israelites' things. They are being oppressed. The Israelites are being oppressed. But this is actually, you know, when we, we see in the Bible that and you think, why is this happening? Why hasn't God stepped in? This is a moment that God has actually said, continue. Because if you see in Deuteronomy, you'll see that God says, if you obey me, this is under the Mosaic law. This is to the Israelites, to the Jews. This isn't what it is about now. We're in a different covenant. Okay. But you can take the same principle. You can take the same principle. God says through Moses, he said, look, tell the Israelites, tell the children. He says, tell them if they obey me, I will, I will look after them. If they love me and follow my commands, I will protect them and keep them safe from these other nations. But if they don't, I can't, I'll hand them over and other nations will come in and take your crops, take your cattle, do this. So what's happening here is actually a truth that was spoken in Deuteronomy. God said, this will happen if you don't follow my commands. This will happen. So yes, this is in, under the Old Testament. So I'm not saying if you make a mistake and bad things have happened in your life, that's because you did wrong. Okay, that's not how God works. That's not how God works. But there's a principle here that we can take when we keep stepping out of God's will. When we keep walking away from God, when we don't follow his commands, we show if we love him or not. When we live in a lifestyle so opposite to God, we show God if we love him or not. We show him by our actions. And so we step out of that, that protection, if you like. And so we take it from here. So God sent a prophet now to Israel. Israel are under so much um, persecution. He sends them a prophet, verses 8 to 10 it says that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel who said to them thus says the Lord God of Israel I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land he's just reminding them I've done all these things for you Israel I've done all these things for you and this is how you treat me and church God's done so much for us, and this is how we treat him. 
Also, verse 10, it says, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. You see, they started, they started worshipping other gods, basically. And again, you can take the principle any way you want. It doesn't mean that you've got to go to another religion. But actually, in today's world, some of the gods in our lives can be like idols, like money or our possessions or our work. And we can worship the things of this world and, and leave God behind. Just as much, God doesn't like that. Just as much, God doesn't like that. God wants to be centre of our life. He wants to be in his rightful place. There shall be no other, nothing before him. When we step out of God's will, when we step out of God's will like the Israelites were doing, when we choose to turn our back, we open ourselves up. In Psalm 91 verse 1 to 2, when COVID-19 came around, remember about 18 months ago, two years, I can't remember the dates exactly, but COVID-19 came about. Most churches put this on their, their websites and whatnot, then shut their doors. But anyway, most churches put this out. Most people, Christians, put this on their Facebooks. They put it on their Instagrams. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. They would carry on the verse a little bit more because it speaks about 10,000 may fall here, but, you know, God's got us. And they would use this. This is the God I serve. But if we look at verse one, it says he who dwells. So it's saying to you, look, if you dwell in the secret place, if you dwell in the house of God, if you follow Jesus, if he's your number one, if you are under his arm, then you can grab hold of all these promises. But most people try to take the promises without actually sitting under him. And I'm not saying like I threw a little bit of a, they all put this up and then shut their doors. That was just my sense of humor that wasn't yours. It's OK if people shut their doors. I'm not saying only those that kept their doors open can say this as a truth. OK, I'm not saying that. Just wanted to clear that up. Just thought about it. Um, but in our lives, church, in our lives, I would definitely say so many of us claim that promise and so many of us weren't doing the first bit. And so you've got to see the, the principles. You've got to see the things that we're going to take from Gideon. The Israelites, they only cried out to God because they were being oppressed. I see that so often. People only cry out to God when they're in tough times. Like, they're going well with God, going well with God, going well with God. Then life's good. They start to drift off, drift off, drift off, drift off. No longer see them. Disaster happens in their house, in their family. Back into church they come. Find God. Life's going well, going well, going well, going well, going well. Drift off, drift off, drift off, drift off. Disaster comes. Back into church. We've got to stop using God like a slot machine. We, we can't just use him when it, when it suits us. We're either for him or against him. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. I'm not saying life's easy. I know it's difficult. I know it's tough. So, so is my life. But there's got to be a consistency and a commitment to God that says, Lord, in the good times, I want to praise your name. In the bad times, I want to praise your name. Because Jesus loves you when you're really good and when you're really bad. He doesn't walk away in your bad times and say, messed up again, I'm out of here. He doesn't do that to you. He's still there saying, I've got you. Just turn on to me. Look on to me. Look on to me. He doesn't just leave you. The Bible says never really leave you nor forsake you. Again, a principle you can take. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. You know, when it says no one can take you out the father's hand. I don't believe anyone can snatch you out the father's hand, but I do believe you can jump out of it. I think there's a difference. I think there's a difference. Anyway, now we come to this place where God chooses a man called Gideon and he says, 
All right, you lot have cried out to me. I send the prophet to you. The prophet says, look, remember what all this, what God has done for you, all what you've done. And the reason why the Midianites are oppressing you is because you're following their gods. You've turned your back on your God. And so now I'm going to use a man called Gideon. He chooses a man called Gideon who, will he, who he will use to deliver Israel this time. Judges 6 verse 12, it says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Verse 14. Then the Lord turned to him and said, go in this might of yours and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So God's given Gideon this call. God said, this is the man I'm going to use. Now go in your strength. Go for it. Gideon gives all the excuses. I can't do it. I'm the least of the least. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Like you got to choose someone else. I can't do this. Like, this cannot be you, God. You cannot be talking to me if you think that I can do this. I'm no mighty warrior. I'm, I'm weak. I'm scared. I'm fearful. Moses had the same encounter with God when God saw him in the, at, the red, at the red bush. It wasn't a red bush. It was the burning bush. At the, the Red Sea and the burning bush. And you just combine them together. It's a new Bible story that I'm teaching. And so at the burning bush... God reveals himself to, to Moses and says, Moses, I'm going to use you to deliver Israel out of Egypt. That was a time before another time when Israel needed delivering. And Moses said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm weak. I stutter. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. God sees his weaknesses and says, I'm still using you. There's a reason why God uses weak people. There's a reason. And we'll see that in a bit. Anyway, God sends Aaron because um, God sees us in our weaknesses and he knows where we are and he doesn't just throw us into the ocean and we drown. He'll send support. He'll send people that can help. We're going to see this with Gideon. He's going to send him a servant at one stage when Gideon's fearful and he, he needs help and he's going to help him because that's what God does. In the world's eyes, in the world's eyes, okay, in the world's eyes, God calls a cowardly young man called Gideon. In the world's eyes, God has called a cowardly young man called Gideon. It's probably the biggest joke among um, people of that time. Probably the biggest joke since the time when God called Abraham, who was childless at the time, a father of a multitude. Like, that must have been, like... Quite a joke back at camp when they heard and Abraham walks back in and says, um, Father of a multitude, my descendant's going to be more than the stars of the, the sky, the sand of the shore. And everyone's like, you've not even got a kid and you're knocking on a bit. <laughs> like, that is a joke. Well, now we've got to another place where we've now got Gideon. He's weak, he's feeble, he's cowardly, he's fearful. And God says, I'm going to use you to deliver Israel from the Midianites. Like, they must have been laughing around the campfire. Surely God needs an outstanding warrior. Surely he needs someone that the world would choose. But God seeks something different. We could share our own story here and we could say how God has, has used us to do things. But let's be honest, we're not necessarily what the world would have picked five and a half years ago they wouldn't have said oh let's start there in that little place and let's spread out let's see but but God does these things that only he can receive the glory because it's never been about the glory of a man or a woman but it's about glory to the father that's what Jesus said he came to bring glory to the father Gideon has one outstanding quality one outstanding quality Gideon has he was thirsty for change he hated the situation that he lived in. He hated the corruption and the sin around him. He was thirsty for change. He was thirsty for God. He was thirsty for his presence. This is why I'm saying church that we're fasting. Fast, fast church. Fast and pray. God, we need your presence. If we become thirsty for his presence, if we become more thirsty for God than anything else, and his presence falls and it dwells among us, and I know 
the, we walk with the presence of God because when you give your life to Jesus, Holy Spirit makes his home in you. So we're carriers of his presence. I get that. So we're walking around. We're walking with God all the time. But when he just sits on a place, when he sits on an area, when he sits in somewhere and he just says, I'm going to do something in this place. That's what I'm crying out for. I'm crying out for why? Because I want to be wherever God is. Like, that's just me being selfish. That's just me being um, what any man or woman of God should be. Like, I want to be where God is. That's where I want to be. So that's why we're crying out through prayer uh, and fasting. He was a heartbroken young man. Gideon is a heartbroken young man by the situation they lived in. And we know that God pours water on the thirsty and he floods the dry grounds. We know that because the Bible tells us that's what he does. Gideon becomes a man of faith and we know that he's going to become a man of faith. But he had to grow in his call. At the start he's fearful. He's a coward in the eyes of the world. But he's going to grow in his faith. He's going to grow in his call. Where you are here... Today, if God's called you and he's called you something big and you're like, I can't do it, I can't do it. It's not about what you are today. It's, it's not about this star. It's about, you know, letting God take you on the walk, take you on the journey. They say prayer is, is amazing prayer, but it's not the start or the finish that's the most amazing bit. What's the most amazing bit is the walk in the middle, the journey to the answer. That's where you grow the most. That's where you die and get reborn again. That, that's where you, you shave off the things in your life that shouldn't be there. That's, that's the journey. That's the most impressive bit. It's this middle bit. We always love the start and we love the finish. But this middle bit we're not too keen on because it can require hard work. It can require some tough times. And so you may be being called to do something that you just cannot do right now. Imagine five and a half years ago, God says to me, Aaron, I've called you by 2022 to be um, a leader of a church or planted in Birmingham. There'll be an Iranian church, four Burundi churches, two um, Rio de Janeiro churches, a Brazilian church that will meet in Birmingham, an Iranian church underground over in Iran there's going to be Mozambique there's going to be oh her screens coming in as well and all this imagine if God had said that five and a half years ago to be totally honest with you five years is not a very long time to see those kind of things happen it has gone so quick so fast so quick so fast if you were there at the beginning of the journey you will have had the privilege of just seeing all these things open up from small beginnings. Don't despise small beginnings, church. Don't despise small beginnings. But how have we got to there? Because the man that started there, as in I'm talking about myself right now, there is no way I can get to there. There's no way I can get to there. Five years ago, no way I can get to there. You've chose the wrong man. You, you must have chose the wrong person. Let's be honest, you must have chose the wrong church. Nothing good comes out of Albury. Was it nothing good comes out of Nazareth? That's the one. Yeah, nothing good comes out of Albury. Just change the word. That's like, it can't be. We're the weakest clan. We're the smallest. We're, we're, we're smaller than the Benjamites. Like, we can't be used. It surely is in us. And God says, in your weakness, my strength is going to be made perfect. And so you see, God knows what he's doing. But from here, no chance. But as you start walking, you start to grow in the confidence of the call that he's put on your life. And you start to grow more and more in the confidence of who he is. Every time you see him do another testimony, every time you see him save another life, you believe next week we're going for more. Then it's like tomorrow, we're going to grab another one tomorrow. In prayer evening, let's have a salvation in prayer evening. Let's go to the ends of the world. Now he's risen our faith to such a place where it's not just about individual salvations on, in a week's service, but actually each day now it's like, where are we going to plant a new church? Now, imagine in five years' time, 
Imagine what it's going to look like in five years' time. But I think our prayers are going to be more about taking hold of areas and, and strongholds and like, yeah, we're going to move into this area and we, we go into an area, say in Burundi, Burundi, use Burundi as an example because there's a lot of witchcraft in Burundi. There's a lot of witch doctors. There'll be areas there that are, are under the, the curse of satanic oppression and hold and we're going to go plant a church there and it will transform the area. And all of a sudden, this impoverished area will, will become full of the fruit of God. And we'll be taking the gospel and changing communities, changing areas, just like we can in the UK, by the way, because the God of Africa is the God of the UK. And so we can do that right here as well. I must admit it can be harder to achieve in the UK for some reason, harder to achieve in the West. That's got everything to do with unbelief. Hence why we pray, Lord, remove unbelief from my life. Remove it from our church. Because when you sit under unbelief, it stops and it fights against this word called faith, which is so, so important. And doubting, doubting um, isn't unbelief. I saw that mentioned in one of the leaders minutes recently. And it's true. Doubting isn't unbelief doubts come into all of us but when they come knock them out keep your eyes focused on jesus even in the doubts keep them focused on jesus anyway god tells gideon go tear down the altar of baal judges 6 27 so gideon took 10 men from among his servants and did as the lord had said to him but because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day he did it by night Gideon's a scared boy. Like, you got some people that are like, God, you said me to do that. I'm going to let the world know that I'm doing that for Jesus. Like, there's those kind of characters. Like, everybody, watch what I'm going to do now. All for Jesus. You, come here. Let's deal with that stronghold in your life. You, let's pour down that altar. Let's pour down. Let's tear it down. Let the world see what we're doing for Jesus. Some people are like that. But Gideon... He's scared, he's fearful, and he's saying, you know what, I'm going to do this at night time because this is, this is a bit tough for me. This is too much. And so he does it at night. The point is he's scared, he's fearful, he's, he's not going well, and yet he still accomplished what was needed. He still accomplished what was needed. He's no mighty warrior. He's just an average guy, average Joe. Well, 99% of the world are just average Joes. We need so many average Joes just to step up and say, I do it, but I'm fearful, I'm worried, I've got all these weaknesses, great, we can use you in that. Note, we need to apply the word of God to our lives first before we can go out for him. God says, go tear down the altar. He goes and tears it down. We need to apply it to our own lives first. There are altars in your own lives that you need to tear down before we take on the battle outside. Hence fasting, prayer, fasting. We need to tear down the altars in our own lives before we can tear down the altars in their lives. We need to, you know, revival, if you like, judgment. It, it starts at the house of God, as the Bible says. It must first start with us. But there's an army that, if you know the story of Gideon, you'll, you'll know it quite well. And we just quickly look at it. In this army that God says to Gideon, look, I'm going to use you to deliver Israel. I'm going to give you this army. You've got 32,000 men there. OK, 32,000 men and the enemy, they've got 135,000 men. The odds are stacked against Israel. If you know anything about the six day war in 1967 with Israel, it's kind of even worse than that. All right. It's even worse than that. The odds are against Israel. It's like, I think this works out at one man, one Israelite would be fighting. Oh, I can't do the maths right in my head right now. I, I had it for a second. Like literally, you think you haven't, but I've got a different calculation going. I think I've got it for the end army, what Gideon's going to use. Because eventually it's going to come to a place where there's only 300 men. And God said, I'm just going to use 300 men. He's going to whittle it down from 32,000, which then there ends up being 300 men. 
and that would be about 500 or f between four to 500 enemy people would stand against just one Israelite at that. Like that's the odds we're against. Like there is no way, absolutely no way, one man is going to take on 500 enemy soldiers. There's going to be 300, that's all there's going to be, 300 Israelites remaining. But there's 10,000 strong men, 10,000 strong, brave people left from those 32,000. Because God says to these 32,000 soldiers of the Israelites, he says, anyone who's scared or fearful, you can go back to your home now. 22,000 left. So there's 10,000 left. That means they're 10,000 brave, strong people. Gideon's getting stronger. But they're brave, they're strong, they haven't gone home. And God says, still, there's too many people. Still too many people here. Let's whittle it down a little bit more. And so we take it. Like, I, this is the bit that really confuses me because he says, look, everyone go down to the lake. Let them drink water. And those that, you know, go like this, pick the water up and like that. Those that do that, send them back home. No, keep those ones. Keep those ones. Those that do that, keep them. All right? The other lot, if they go down to the water and they <laughs> lap like a dog, look, how many? Look, there's 300 people went like that, yeah? 300 went like that. Do the maths. 9,700 drank water like Maxi. <laughs> Who does that? What? Just by a, a show of hands, if you went down to the lake, <laughs> would you have got sent home or would you have had to go out and fight? Who would have, by a show of hands, lapped like a dog? John. <laughs> Fantastic. John, we're going to have to start with some jokes on you. So. John's getting sent home. The rest of you would have drank like that? Yeah, that's how I would have drank. We'll go into war. I'm just so surprised that like, so many of the Israelites lap like a dog. I just thought you would have just gone down. It's just a, a thing that I'm thinking. Don't worry about it. It's nothing to this. You've missed it. How? If you went down to a lake, <laughs> if you went down to a lake yeah, and there's water there, would you drink like this? It's the only way I can do it. <laughs> or would you drink like that? Which one would you do? One or two? Two. two. You're going to war. Going to, war. to war. <laughs> war. So, 9,700 Israelites lap like a dog. God says, send those ones back home. Yes, send those ones back home. The other 300 to drink like that, I'm going to use them. I'm still trying to understand how more of the army can lap like a dog than drink normally. But anyway, maybe that's just the way they drink. Maybe the 300 were the weird ones back in those days. And everyone's like, what are you using your hand for? That's disgusting. You've got dirty hands. Maybe it's because they had dirty hands. Ah, Holy Spirit moments. <laughs> Anyway, I think that's what it is. Write it down, Luke. Put that in your teachings. The reason why is due to cleansliness. Because, uh, hey, Helen, don't insult the words. Anyway, Judges 7, verse 2. Why? Why, 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 why does God say, I use 300 people? You had 32,000 people and you've whittled it all the way down to 300. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Least Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying my own hand has saved me. God says the reason why I'm going to bring it all the way down to 300 is because if I let 10,000 or if I let 22,000 or 32,000, if I let that amount of soldiers go out, you'll say that you had something to do with it. And I want you to know it's absolutely nothing to do with you. And that's why God can take a small place and change an area or change a nation. Because the glory should never be on the man or the woman or the church. The glory should always be 
on him. Verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 and 10. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. Like, I've missed bits, chunks out of the story just so we can hurry up and make sure we finish. But Gideon, all the way through this, he's, he's dropping down a fleece. And like, if this is really you, God, I need you to prove it to me. Like, he is constant. Gideon's always like... I need you to prove this. I need you to confirm this again. I need you to confirm this again. I need you to confirm this again. Now we've got to the place where Gideon's scared, it's still fearful, like God's told him you're going to be used. He needs more confirmation. He needs more confirmation. So God says to him, look, go down to the enemy camp. Just stand just outside it, like listen in. There's going to be some people talking there. That's going to be your confirmation. And so now Gideon, he's just listening in. He's going to go down there. But this is what I wanted to say about the weak side of us. Like God always gives us the support that we need. God says to Gideon, he says, look, I know you're fearful. I know you're scared. I want you to go down there. If you can't go on your own, take your servant with you. Take your servant with you. And what happens is Gideon goes down to the camp and he hears men talking. And it says that he took his servant with him. It's all right to be weak, church. It's all right to be scared. It's all right to take somebody with you. It's all right not to be, you know, some mighty warrior like David. It's all right to be Gideon. It's all right. Because God's going to do some miraculous things with Gideon. In verse 11, he's taking his servant. God confirms for Gideon now in verse 13 and 15. And when Gideon had come there, there was a man telling a dream. So Gideon's gone down to the edge of the camp. He's listening in, okay? Just as God said, go listen in, I'll confirm it for you. So he's listening to a man telling a dream to his companion. And this man says, I've had a dream to my surprise. A loaf of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and it struck it so that it fell and overturned and the tent collapsed. Then his companion answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. Into his hand, God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation that he worshipped. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. God confirms his word. And so when we go out and we do think God's going to confirm it before we step out in things. We don't step out like headless chickens just running around trying to do everything. But God will confirm his word to us. But there's always a strategy. Moving on to verse 16 to 22, I think. Then he divided the 300 men into three companies. Gideon's gone up to his 300 men. He said, OK, guys, strategy now. Let's divide you. We're going to go do this. God has delivered it. God said, go now. So he delivered, he, he divided the 300 men into three companies and he put a trumpet into every man's hand with empty pitchers and torches inside the pitchers. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Look at me and do likewise. That just jumps out at me because um, as leaders, like talking to leaders and people that will grow into be leaders, etc., Look at me and do likewise. Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Like you can't expect anyone else to do it if you yourself won't do it. And so as leaders, that's why I believe we, we, must, we must set a standard as such. We can't expect others to give if we ourselves don't give. We can't expect others to pray if we ourselves don't pray. We can't expect others to fast if we ourselves don't fast. We can't expect others to, to come to prayer if we ourselves don't turn up. And so on, and so on, and so on. We set the standard at the same time. Leaders can't do everything. All right? That's why the body of Christ is needed. But we must set that standard. We wouldn't ask anyone else to do something we ourselves wouldn't do. And he said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet and all are with me, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Remember, that was in the dream. Sometimes people ask me, why are you so desperate to have um, like LBC's name on the 
church. Like when churches have come, I've got a, a meeting with a church on the 23rd, 24th from um, Leicester. And they, they want to talk to me about the possibility of them coming under us and what that would look like. And the one thing I have to stay with is your name would have to be LBC, whatever your name is. Why? Because I had a vision. And in the vision, every church was LBC and then the area. And so I've just stuck everything to the vision, even though for you it might be just a small thing. Don't worry about a name. Who cares about a name? The only name we need to care about genuinely is the name of Jesus. But in the vision, it was just clear. In the vision here, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, it was in the vision. And it's going to play a part later on. A verse... 19, so Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch. Middle watch, that's key. Middle watch, people have been out on sentry duty. People have got their swords. There's armed people walking back into a dark camp right now. There are armed people walking back into a dark camp. And there's other armed people getting up, just about to go out to their posts to take over. So you've got this happening. Armed people walking through a camp that's pitch black it's night time i hope no one smashes any bottles or anything good cause creation anyway so where are we posted watch outpost of the camp we'll do again from 19 so gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just as they had posted the watch and they blew the trumpets and broke the pictures that were in their hands then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing. And they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. It means something because those people that were talking, this is the dream I had. Uh, and then this is what the interpretation is. I guarantee they went back into camp and they were speaking to people. I've had this dream. Oh, and this happened and this happened. And I heard the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And I saw it Or This is the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So when, when this is about to kick off in a moment and these people are just waking up and all they can hear is the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. They've already, it's already been sold into them because it's been talked about in their camps. It's been talked about around the fire. It's, it's so important that we, we follow directly every little bit that God calls us to do. If he gives us a tiny command, it's so important that we listen to that tiny command because it could be so, so vital for the victory. Verse 21 and every man stood in his place all around the camp and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. When the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. Uh, imagine, it's dark. Uh, a rumour's gone round about Gideon. There's only 300 of them, but they don't know that. They don't know that. It's dark. There are people walking through the camp with their swords. They're just going out to their posts. It's the middle watch. There's some people coming back with their swords. When all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the pitchers are thrown, the, the jars, they are smashed as one man. As one man. Unity is key. If they don't do it as one man, if they don't do it as one man, it's not going to have to crash, it's not going to have to bang, it's not going to have to sound. They blow their trumpets and they all shout as one man. As one man. And in that confusion, yes, there's a divine moment in there as well. But you can see the strategy that's been set up. As people wake up in this dark camp, they can't see in front of them type thing. And there's armed people. And all of a sudden, the people just waking up, all they're hearing is a smash, a crash, a bang, the trumpet sounds. And they can see it and hear people running through the camp. What's going on? They pull out their sword. There's confusion, there's chaos, there's mayhem. And they start killing one another. You can picture it. You can see it. And yet, as I was writing it down, I just felt God saying, be careful that the enemy doesn't imitate that on the church. Because in confusion and misinterpretation and everything else, we kill one another, church. Be careful that the enemy doesn't turn back on us. 
you know, tactics and imitate what, what God has done because we know that he's an imitator. We know that he will imitate the works of God. We know that because that's what he does. That's what he does. Our greatest weapon, though, church, is unity. And that's why the enemy will always come against unity. Our greatest weapon is unity. We must stand together. We must be one church. The early church, they were of one accord, one mind, one spirit. It's always one this, one that, one this, one that. We have too many divisions in church, too many divisions in, in houses. We've got to be of one spirit, one mind. If we are going to see God come through, we have to be together. And that's why when we have strategies, we must do it together as one. That's why I encourage everyone to pick up the fasting. I don't think you should leave it to those, those few that are good. Oh, that's their ministry. No, it's our ministry. Matthew verse 6, chapter 6, sorry. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, when you fast. Not if you fast, when you fast. Just like he says, when you pray. Or just like he says, when you give. I know like we like to pick certain bits out and we don't like to pick other bits out. But the reality is, those were three things there that God expected of man and woman. To one, to pray. Two, to fast. And three, to give. Those three things. And yet, we can struggle, probably we can struggle with all three of them. We can struggle with all three of those things. They're obviously important for a reason. It would be going completely off to try and go into all that now, but they're important for a reason. Let, let's, let's just finish really quickly because I've got to get the team up. Judges 8 verse 4. You know, after this has happened and the, all the Midianites have been killing themselves, mayhem's happened, some have, some have ran, and Gideon says, come on, after them. There's only 300 of them. Like, this is incredible, like match against the odds like this is Cambridge United beating Newcastle United 1-0 how rubbish in Newcastle this is Cambridge United doing Newcastle in their own backyard when Gideon came to the Jordan he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over exhausted but still in pursuit it's tiring church no one says it's going to be easy it's tiring okay it, it's tiring. The work of the Lord is tiring. And that's why every hand is needed. It can't just be ones and twos. It can't just be the select few. We've got to change the stats. The stats say that 20% of your giving comes, no, 100% of your giving, but majority of your giving comes from 20% of your people. That's what it says. So the giving that comes into the church, it will come from 20% of the church. That's the reality. Same with workers. Your workers, it will be 20%. The people that always work, it will be the same 20%. Just like the people that always give, it will be the same 20%. The people that always turn up for prayer, it will be the same 20%. The people that will fast will be the same 20%. Let's turn those odds on its head. Let's, let's go 80-20 in God's favour. Let's turn it on its head, church. Let's turn it on its head. 80-20, God's favour.